welcome to this session. This is the third session of Buddhism. In this session, we will discuss some of the theories that Buddhist school proposed. As you know that, till today, what we have discussed on Buddhism, or in other words, last two classes, previous classes and previous to previous classes, what we had discussed are that there is a historical, brief historical background of Buddhism. There we have said that who are the scholars really contributed for the development of different theory in Buddhism and how Buddhism took a long time to develop all of its theory which we celebrate today, which we discuss today. And also we said that there are four Buddhist council organized while developing Buddhist thought. And it is organized by the Buddhist followers or monks, Buddhist monks. Then after that, we had discussed that in Buddhism, we find four noble truths. And the four noble truths, Buddha, after receiving the enlightenment or Mahapari Nirvana in the age of 80, whatever the knowledge he gained or he earned, he taught to his disciples saying that in life there are four noble truths that is unavoidable or practically one must find the four noble truths. And these are the first one they said that suffering, the world is full of pain and misery. He starts with a pessimistic view in saying that the world since you are a living creature, the world is full of pain and misery and suffering one suffer because he or she is clinging towards the different objects for the different purposes. Since we as a human being, we are attaching to the different objects for different purposes, we have a desire, we have an inclination. We aim to achieve many more things in this life and henceforth suffering starts. So, extending to his view also he said that he goes to an extent also said that the pleasant pleasure that you claim or a person claim of his or her pleasant pleasure may not be remain as it is in the future time. Henceforth, the pleasure turns out to be pain or suffering. Therefore, he said that suffering is unavoidable. The whole world is suffering and that is the truth. The second point, the second noble truth, he said that Dukkha Samudaya, there are causes of suffering. And while discussing the causes of suffering, he said that, that how these 12 Nidanas operates one after another and how one thing is dependent on other in a successive way. And the last, he concluded that it is the ignorance, is the root cause of all suffering. We as a human being, we blindly believe that we need many more things, we can attain many more things and all are because of the ignorance. The third point they said that since we know that there are causes of suffering, we can dig out that causes, we can find out the causes so that we can seize the suffering, we can stop our suffering while living in this earth. Therefore, the third noble truth is talking about the cessation of suffering or Dukkha Niradu and the fourth or the final one, the noble truth is talking about that there is a way, if you practice that way, if you adopt that way, then you have to do some practice and rituals as Buddhist monk clearly mentioned. In Buddhism, this is clearly mentioned that how their practices are more rational, more intelligent than the earlier Hindu practices. And also said that one need to understand rationally and must have a justified belief to practice those practices and henceforth there is a possibility one can get liberation while living in this earth as well. Therefore, Buddhism prescribes eight fold path or in other words they said that it is Arya Ashtanga Marga that means noble eight fold path. Start with Samyak Vijan, then 
other things follow samyak bhag samyak ajiva and the last one is samyak samadhi so there are eight steps buddhism prescribes very clearly and saying that one step leads to another steps and one need to practice each steps with determination and full of concentration if this is the case then a person an individual while living in this earth also can receive or attain the liberation this is the brief what we had discussed so far in today's class what we will discuss is that there are some of the theories and very rudiment theories or principal theories without that buddhism has no meaning or you can say that buddhism is a unique system or unique indian school which contributes many theory many theory those are unique in their nature the first one is pratitya samutpadavada pratitya samutpada and today class we will discuss in elaborate what is pratitya and what is samutpadavada but just for your knowledge i must tell you that pratitya samutpada is the principal theory on which all other theories rest upon it is the bedrock on which all other theories based on the second one is a metaphysical implications of pratitya samutpada known as khyanika vada what khyanika vada talks about is that that every moment is changing even two single moment are not alike what i saw now and once my eyelid shut down and again i see an object these two moments are totally different and you can realize that once you see something suppose you see a rainbow in the sky and after once you close your eyelids and upon it the rainbow disappears an example i have given in the similar example many other things you have seen already in your personal life and here buddhism said that this khyanika vada this exactly talks about the momentariness that nothing is permanent in this earth neither the cognizer nor the cognition nor the process of cognition nothing is permanent everything is temporary both physical and non physical objects both animate and inanimate objects in the third theory known as anatma vada anatma vada speaks about that that if nothing is permanent the soul that we believe that soul resides in the human being as a result we claim that the body is an active one the body is a rational one and here buddhism claims also that that the soul is not a permanent it is even temporary so therefore they do not believe the existence of soul according to them they say that if nothing is permanent how come the soul becomes a permanent and therefore they claim the theory which is known as the non existence of soul permanently so these are the three theories among other theories you find in buddhism however we'll discuss these three theories first we'll discuss pratitya samutpadavada then its metaphysical implications one is khyanika vada or the theory of momentariness and the second one is anatma vada or the theory of non existence of soul now let us start with pratitya samutpada vada according to buddhism as you know that they said that nothing is absolute in its pure term nothing is final nothing is eternal so therefore we cannot claim anything as such as absolute everything is depend on others and therefore the world exist and hence for for them every object everything and every event has a beginning has an extinction has a destruction therefore they believe in three things one is beginning second one is existence or the continuous form and the third one is destroy or the extinction now let us discuss in detail pratitya samutpadavada pratitya samutpadavada as i said is a nucleus to buddhist philosophy it is the fundamental principle where other principles rest on it the buddha has called it 
buddhi buddhi means your intelligence as well as dhamma dhamma means some sorts of regularity buddhism said that it is a buddhi pratitya samutpadavada is nothing but the intelligence a human beings rational capacity or the rational principle based on which a human being living a human being taking a decision or a human being acting upon something so in this way you must understand in a very widely pratitya samutpada is known as buddhi or dhamma dhamma means some sort of regularity now we'll discuss what is regularity the mean regularity for them is nothing but a successive steps an example i'll give the the example that i had given many times to you again i'm repeating for example you see now you can perceive a table which is in front of you you see it's a perfectly all right because it's newly made its color is good surface is very clear and everything is good now after few years if you see the same table occupying the same space in a same room you find that the color is not remain as it is the way you had seen in the long back neither the surface is so smooth hence for you conclude that the change is perceivable change is noticeable how it is changed it changed each moment however the two moment are so dependent with each other that we are all the times make a illusion saying that that object is the same object which i had seen long back however it is not so what you are perceiving now to the table if it is same as it was perceived in the earlier time then you don't find any change in the present time as well therefore buddhist claim that each moment it is changing however we as a human being because of our ignorance we are in illusion we cannot identify the successive steps that one steps depends on other steps and other steps depend on other steps and if you accumulate all these steps then you perceive the change in that object further example i'll give your nail grows once you cut the nail on your finger then after one week you find that again your nail grows but no time you have found that now your nail is growing this is so because everything is changing things are moving and it is so moving so successively so firstly that one product one event is depend on others and as a result we could not identify the difference between one in one hand and another in a, another hand therefore we find that everything is changing and we could not make a difference out of it in this way buddhist said that our hair also grows now you go to a salon you have cut your hair you find that everything all right you looks good you looks either beautiful or handsome after some time your hair grows you feel suffocation here buddhist claim that at no point of time we claim that now my hair is growing but however after some time you noticed that your hair is growing and how it happens because every moment is changing no moment is fixed there nothing is absolute in that sense this is all about pratitya samutpada further they said that it is a regularity you find that each steps is depend on other steps therefore you find a regularity between the preceding steps and the further steps further buddhism said that that whoever sees dhamma sees pratitya samutpada in other words one who understands the pratitya samutpada he or she can understand dhamma and inversely the reason is very clear for buddhism because buddhism said that that if you see that something is regularly moving pratitya samutpada it is same as dhamma that means you can see that things are moving very subsequently and some or other form you are noticed something and many other form you could not able to notice it therefore he said that either if you see dhamma you see pratitya samutpada and also having the inverse relation that means an individual if he or she can understand what is pratitya samutpada can understand the regularity can understand the dhamma and also having the inverse relation as well now moving to the next point that pratitya samutpada is relative as well as absolute it is relative because you find 
all the objects are changing in this world. Therefore, it is relative and everything that you see changing you find in this world. Further, they said that Pratitya Samutpada also is an absolute and in which context they said that? They said that we as a human being we are suffering in this earth. We are suffering because we have a desire, we have many inclinations towards the different objects in this earth. He is saying that all the desires, all the inclinations can be seized, can be stopped if you practice the Arya Noble Eightfold Path. Therefore, said that liberation can be possible while living in this earth. In this sense, if you see that the Arya Eightfold Paths depend on one another, each step is depend on others and the last step Samyak Samadhi where one can attain the liberation, one can receive the Nirvana, one can achieve the Nirvana, one can seize all the suffering pain from his earthly life. Therefore, in this context even Patitya Samadpada deals with the absolute which talks about the liberation. So, all these things you find in Buddhist philosophy. Further, they said that it is a diamond or jewel among other teachings of Buddha because it is the fundamental principle on which all other theories rest upon. You know that there are three pitaka we find in Buddhism. One is Sutta pitaka, second one is Binaya pitaka and the third one is Abhidharma pitaka. In Sutta pitaka, it is explained, Pratitya Samutpada is described in this way. It is a Sanskrit verse, you can see that Pratitya Samutpada Pasyati Sa Dharma Pasyati. I repeat, say that in the Sutta Pitaka, you find that the description of Pratitya Samutpada in this way Pratitya Samutpada Pasyati Sa Dharma Pasyati. That means, if you see the Pratitya Samutpada, you can understand the Dhamma, D H M M A, Dhamma, which means a regularity, some sorts of regularity, that how each steps depends on other steps and how that steps depends on other steps. If you accumulate everything, you find that the step 1 and the step n, the last step, you find there is a change in it. So, in this way, you find that objects, events, even persons, even the animal and non-animals are changing in this world. Nothing is permanent according to Buddhism. Now, further he said that Pratitya Samadpada is divided into three parts. Prati, Itya, Samadpada. Prati stands for each and every and if you if you accumulate these three words Prati, Itya, Samadpada, Bada, what it means is that which is dissolved appear again. That means, as Buddhism said that every event, every object, every animal must have a beginning, then have a existence that means, there is a continuous flow, then extinction that means, there is a destruction, there is a death. In this way, they said that whatever you think is a disappear and dissolved again appear. In this world, whatever is dissolved, whatever is destroyed appear again and again. So, this is in a very brief, they described Pratitya Samutpadavad. Further, they said that everything is subject to dissolution and those dissolve appear again and again is known as Pratitya Samutpadavada. Here, Buddhism take a middle path and rejecting the two other alternative theory in a both extreme cases. In a negative side, you find Ucheda Bada or you say that Ucheda Bada or annihilation or nihilism. In the right side, positive, extreme positive, you find Sasvatavada. What is Sasvatabhada is about? Sasvatabhada talks about that eternality, that a particular object exists eternally. It does not depend on others. It is pure in its absolute form. It does not require any other things for its own existence. On the other hand, in the extreme negative, you find Uchchadabhada, which say that everything has a dissolution, nothing exists in this world and we cannot claim that something is exist in this world. Because once you, you see further that object, that object not remain as it is. 
because it, again it dissolved, again it is destroyed. If you see the both extreme, Buddhists taken the middle path, they are saying that things are exist, but these are not eternal. That means, Buddhism here taking a middle path, they are rejecting in one side, which is a extreme positive known as Saswatabad, in the other side, in the extreme negative known as Uchchadabad. So, therefore, Buddhism while adhering the principle Pratitya Samadpada, they said that we, we are claiming some kind of principle which is known as Madhyama Marga. Madhyama Marga talks about the rejection of Uchchadabada and Saswatabada. Now, Pratitya Samadpada expresses that things have existence, but they are not eternal as I said to you now. The root of Pratitya Samadpada is found in second noble truth Dukkha Samadaya. See there is a relation, the first point and the second point. I said that Pratitya Samadpada is a doctrine, talks about everything dissolve in this earth again appear, appear again and again. If this is the case, you find that in the second noble truth, he talks about Dwadasa Chakra or the twelve spokes. That means, why you are suffering? Because we, we burn in this earth. Why we burn? Because there is a will to become and so on and so forth. There are 12 arguments you find in Buddhist second noble truth. And the last we conclude that it is the ignorance because of which we burn, we are suffering in this earth. So, since they prescribed the Pratitya Samadpada, they said that how each step depends on other steps and the root cause is that ignorance. And therefore, he said that this Pratitya Samudpadavada is certainly derives from his second noble truth, which talks about Dukkha Samudaya, that why there are causes exist as a result we are suffering and what are those causes. And causes as you know, it is very clear to you, it is our desire and attachment towards the different objects of the world. Therefore, the first step and the second step is a clearly linked to each other. The first step I said that Pratitya Samudhapadavada expresses that things have existence, but they are not eternal. And the second point I said the root of Pratitya Samudhapadavada is found in the second noble truth that is Dukkha Samudaya. Now, you can see the link. The third point I made that Dukkha Samudaya addresses the concept Bhava Chakra. Bhava Chakra means there is a 12 spoke in a wheel is known as Dwadasa Nidana or Bhava Chakra. According to Lord Buddha, nothing can come into being accidentally or by chance. In this world, nothing is uncaused, everything caused by something else and that is the principal law of the cosmos. Unlike Charvaka, according to Charvaka, soul also exist accidentally in human body and once the body dies, the soul also dies with the body. So, therefore, Buddhism never endures Charvaka's view. Buddhism counteracting Charvaka view and claim that, that nothing happens accidentally and we cannot claim that something happened accidentally because things are dependent on each other, things are linked to each other. As a result, we have find many more things in this earth and this is the principal law of the cosmos. And in the universe, if you find different things and we are using different things for the different purpose, because one thing is linked on other things, one thing is dependent on other things. In this context, therefore, you find that according to Buddhism, nothing is purely absolute and exists in its pure form because everything is changing, everything is momentary. So, this is the metaphysical doctrine you find that, which is a center point on which all other theories revolve around. Now, further saying that, the Pratitya Samudpadavada is elucidated by the help of following four factors and these are the factors that you must know. The first factor is that the regularity of sequence. What is regularity of sequence? We as a human being cannot stop a sequence. 
there is a cause and effect relation in all the cases because Buddhism unlike Charvaka said that things depend on each other, no thing exists independently and the regularity the things are changing step by step we cannot stop that process. By explaining this point Charvaka said that if there are some conditions given and if that is the cause then certainly whatever the desired effect certainly it will come out. For example, if you study good, if you understand the content and if you have a wish to do and if you have a good writing skills certainly you will qualify in the exam for which you have prepared. For example, you have prepared for an entrance exam and you know that what are things supposed to come out, what are the possible questions and you have worked on it, you have a good writing skills, henceforth you can click on it. Therefore, if some preconditions causes are there and certainly it leads to some desirable effect. In other words, to derive some desirable effect from a cause, we need some preconditions in the cause and henceforth cause effect having very tight knit association or a relation, inseparable relation with each other. Explaining this point, Buddhism said that if a thing or an event is said to be an effect, the circumstances that make it appear shall be its cause. I repeat further, if a thing or an event is said to be an effect, the circumstances that make it appear shall be its cause. The second point they said absence of irregularity. What they mean is that when all the conditions are present, failure to get the desirable effect is ruled out. The second point explaining further, if I say that the cord is derived from the milk or the cord is the effect milk is the cause. If milk, if you keep say 15 days, 20 days or say more than 5 days, certainly it will turns into curd. No one can stop the milk to turn into curd and henceforth he is saying that. Now, milk is a liquid, can you put any other liquid and keep it preserved for 15 days, will it be turned into curd? Certainly not. If this is the case that means cause effect has a close relation, the curd can be derived, can be produced from milk only, not from any other liquid. Therefore, they said that absence of irregularity, we never find anywhere which is known as absence of irregularity. That means, there is a preconditioned cause involved, however, we do not find the desired effect from it. The third point they said, absence of disorderly composition, cause and effect are related coherently and hence inseparable from each other. Disorderly composition means a particular effect can derive from a cause and a particular cause is expected to turn sound to a particular effect and henceforth they have an inseparable relation. Whatever effort we will put, we cannot make a things to turn out some other thing which is not inherently exist in its cause. In other words, any effect that we want to derive from any cause is, is ruled out, this is not possible. A wooden table can be made from wood, a iron table can be made from the iron. You cannot make the interchange, you cannot say that a iron table can be made from the wood or a wooden table can be made from the iron. Therefore, cause and effect are inseparably related with each other as you find that everything has a beginning and existence and destruction. There is a cause, there is a effect and since there is a cause, there should be an effect and since there is an effect, it is derived from a cause and the effect not remain as an effect forever. Again, this effect turns into some other effect. When it turns into some other effect, the initial effect will be now termed as a cause. In this way, you find the whole objects in this earth has dependent with each other. Each object is dependent with each other. The dependent theory that how a particular object or an event 
is depending on others. That is the prescription of Pratitya Samutpadupada. Further, the said, the last point is known as determinancy. Determinancy, what it means is that a set of cause determine to produce a set of effect. It cannot produce other effect which is not possible. As I said that we cannot produce a wooden table from the iron material. In this way, if you explain the four points, you find that cause and effect have a coherently and inseparable relation with each other. And this is the bedrock or this is the, the fundamental principles which Buddhism prescribes saying that everything is dependent on others for its existence. Thus, it claims that having a cause and giving rise not to the effect, not to the any of the desired effect is impossible. To prove this, he has given the following arguments. The arguments are as follows. Said that when cause is there, the effect will come out. If there is a cause, if there is a milk and you keep it for few more days, certainly the effect will come out. You cannot stop the effect, saying that let effect should not come out from the cause. If the cause is not there, then effect cannot come out. If milk won't be there, then cause cannot come out. If you keep the water or preserve the water for 15 days, you say that cause to be emerged from this water, this is not possible. Therefore, if there is no causes, there is no effect. And if we can stop the causes, the effect automatically stopped. The third point is said that if we stop the cause, the effect is automatically stopped. Thus, Buddhist theory of causation constitute of five consecutive steps known as Panchakarni. The theory of causation which constitutes in five elements no, or five consecutive steps known as Panchakarni. Now, these Panchakarnis are as follows. Non-existence of the effect. If there is no cause, certainly you do not find the effect. The second one, existence of the cause. That means, if cause is existent and we can see the cause, the effect is bound to happen, bound to occur. The third point, existence of the effect is an immediate successor. Once you have a cause, then there is an effect, because things are changing. Nothing is constant, nothing is final. However, a particular thing may take a little time to change, which is a noticeable and other things may not take that much time for its change, which can be noticeable. For example, if you keep an apple for 2-3 days, certainly it will return, it will damage it. But if you keep the table 2-3 days, you cannot identify the change in it. However, if you keep the apple on a table for 2-3 days, you can see the changes in it. The third point, existence of the effect is an immediate successor. As I said, that the fourth step, disappearance of the cause. Once the cause turns into effect, the cause never remains as a cause. Once the milk turns into cord, from the cord you cannot search out milk. In the same way, the fifth point, the disappearance of the effect. Once that effect again turns into a effect, the effect not remain as a effect, it will be turns into a cause. So, in this way you find the causal chain, everything is depending on others. No such event exists timelessly, no such event exists eternal, things are dependent on each other in this way. The last point I conclude that Pratitya Samutpada has two dimensions and these are considered as metaphysical implications of it. As I said at the first of this session that Pratitya Samutpada Bada is a theory has a two dimensions and these are considered to be metaphysical implications of it and these are nothing but one is Khyanika Bada or Anitya Bada and the second one is Anatma Bada or Nairatma Bada. The first one talks about that nothing is permanent in this earth, not even two moments are alike. And the second point, the said that the soul which is believed to be exist eternally, which is not the case according to Buddhism. Therefore, Buddhism said that there is 
non-existence of soul. Now we will discuss Khyanikavada. Khyanikavada talks about momentariness and how no things exist even in a single moment. The Khyanikavada is later developed by Buddhist philosopher. The name Khyanikavada is developed by the Buddhist followers in the later period. However, initially the name was given by Gautam Buddha was impermanence. Theory of impermanence initially the name was given by Gautam Buddha and later it was turned into, it was formulated into a different name known as Khyanikavada or the theory of momentariness. I just read for you. The first Khyanikavada talks about that, that no things are static not even a single moment, everything is in a state of constant flux, nothing is permanent. The second theory explains that there is non-existence of soul. Now, we will discuss Khyanikabada or theory of impermanence in detail now. The doctrine of momentariness is one of the most significant contributions of Buddhism to philosophy, which I have already stated to you. This metaphysical doctrine gives a dynamic concept of reality. As you know that almost all the schools in Indian philosophy has given their view or concern on the ultimate reality, on the principle of reality. Here also Buddhism has given, Buddhism also explains on the reality or the principle reality which revolves around within us as well as in the cosmos. And he explains this reality, the principle of reality of the universe by the help of momentariness, by the help of Khyanikavada. According to him, nothing is permanent, everything is transitory, everything is subject to change and decay. Existence of anything is dependent on certain other factors or conditions. As I said that, the cause effect relation. When such conditions disappear, the thing in question ceases to exist. I say, I am repeating further, which we have already discussed in Patija Samutpadavada. I said that there are some preconditions involved with a cause. As a result, the cause turns into a fact. And because of this, we cannot produce all the effect from any causes. And he is saying that if the conditions are not found in relation to the causes, Certainly, the cause won't turns into the effect. Henceforth, the preconditions also involve. For example, to read your eyes perfectly well, you can see from a certain distance, which is a medically correct certain distance, you can read something. You have also knowledge to identify the letters as well as the conglomeration of letter how it constitute a word. Further, some additional backgrounds needed, for example, light, sufficient light required and you must have a voice to read this text. So, there are to read something, see the preconditions involved. If it is a dark, there is no light, you cannot read things, you cannot see even things. Therefore, if reading is a cause, then you need preconditions like good light, you have a good vision power and if you want to resound the words, you should identify the letters and all this. So, therefore, these are the preconditions required and what will be the effect? The effect is you can read something, you may understand the concept. So, in this way cause and effect are dependent with each other, cause and effect are related with each other in this way. Hence, it is claimed that if there is no cause, there is no effect. In the same way, nothing is eternal in this earth. You find that the cause not remain cause forever, neither the effect is remain effect forever. Therefore, nothing is eternal, nothing is permanent. Thus, according to Buddha, everything has a beginning, existence and extinction. The doctrine impermanence is later developed into the theory Khyanikavada by Gautam Buddha's followers. A thing cannot be same even in a moment. The theory of impermanence goes to an extent said that 
even a single moment is changing. You cannot claim for a single moment, because no two moments are alike, each moments are changing. Further, the said, no two successive moments are alike, a thing cannot be same even if a moment. Examples, a flame of a lamp, water in the river. Now, Heraclitus, as an western thinkers, said that a person cannot take a bath in the same water of a same river, because the water of the river is flowing. Once you take a dip, that means, the water you have touched it, it immediately goes ahead. And the next time, if you want to take the bath in the same river, you have to take in a different water. You cannot claim the water is the same. Henceforth, you find that a person in a same place in a river cannot take the bath two times having the same water. In the same way, by giving an explanation of a lamp, to burn a lamp, we need some say liquid like kerosene. Assume that we consider kerosene. We need an instrument like a lamp and we need fire to burn. Here, what is saying that? Depends on the liquid, the lamp will burn. If say liquid will be 50 milliliters, the lamp will burn for say 4 hours. If you say that full bottle of kerosene can make the lamp to burn say 8 hours. In this case, what Buddha is saying that, now we, we as a human being, we as an cognizer, we find that it is the same lamp which is burning or it is the same flame in that lamp. But Buddhism clarified that it is our ignorance, we could not find the successive moments in that lamp. That means, each moment that you see a flame is different from the next moment, because the, the, the preceding moment is depend on the successive moments and it is so fast that we cannot identify the differences and henceforth it is an illusion based on which we claim that it is the same flame that we have seen since 2 hours back. If you pour the kerosene say half, half liter in that lamp, then the lamp will burn 4 hours and a person with his or her illusion claim that no it is the same flame I have seen since 2 hours, but Buddha here clarified that it is not the same flame. The flame from each moment to another moment is different and because of illusion we cannot make a difference between the successive position of a flame and the preceding one. And henceforth in this way they claim that each and every moment is changing as well. Further they said by explaining this concept they said that each state in the process is conditioned by its previous state and is dependent upon it. This causal connection creates the illusion of continuity. And in this context, he said that, suppose there are two friends and they were close friends in their childhood, after 10 years they are meeting. Here Buddhism is saying that, it is not because of the identity you identify your friends, since everything is changing, both his side as well as your side. Rather, it is because of the similarity, the successive steps. As a result, after 10 years, you recognize your friend, age your friend's name with so and so. You recognize your friend with so and so name because you find the successive steps in him or her. So, therefore, similarity is different from identity. We never recognize a person's which we had seen 10 years back because of its identity relation, rather because of the similarity we identify that person with the same name. Further, they said that whatever is produced changes in every moment. Anything that you find in this earth produced it changes every moment. There are two series of productions, one is homogeneous productions, another is heterogeneous production. In case of homogeneous productions, you find certain things like belief, anger, ego, which are produced in a slow manner. You cannot believe a person immediately, it will happen in a slow manner. But in case of heterogeneous production, you find the change which is noticeable, which is perceivable. For example, after 10 years you see the table which you had seen 10 years back. Now, you are seeing a table which you had seen 10 years back. If this is the case, then you can completely identify the changes in it. Therefore, you, can, you find 
two types of changes in production, one is homogeneous, another is heterogeneous in nature. Further they are saying that we cannot claim neither things are eternal in one hand nor non-existence, complete non-existence in other hand, but what we can claim is that there is a middle path that things are exist, but these are not eternal. Therefore, they said that neither being alone nor non-being alone, but becoming is the reality which is a middle path. In this context, Shankara criticized Buddhist doctrine of momentariness on the following grounds. There are two grounds on which Shankara criticized Buddhist theory of momentariness. He said that, that if soul is momentary, then knowledge is impossible. If you claim that soul is also momentary, it is because of the soul, our mind and sense organs have an impression on an object. Therefore, we cognize or identify an object. And once you claim that the soul is also changing, it is not the same soul which you had seen just one moment before. If this is so, then how we able to remind some of the information which we had seen, which we had ob observed or had stored in the form of impression in our mind in the past. How can we recapitulate some of the information which we had seen or encountered in the past? Because soul is not permanent, it is changing. So, therefore, if you as a Buddhist, if you claim that soul is not eternal, that means knowledge is impossible. The second point, here Sankara claim to the Buddhist saying that causality cannot be understood on the basis of momentariness. Causality cannot be understood on the basis of momentariness. Because once you say cause and effect relation, then immediately things are changing. Then how can you say that effect has a cause? Because once you talk about effect, the cause not remain as it is, because things are changing. Or at all if you think that there is some causes and the cause that you had identified may not be the same cause. And again when you are coming back to the effect, what you claim as an effect what you identify as an effect, it not remain as the same effect for the next moment. So, henceforth, how can you explain that causality is responsible for explaining the reality of the universe? How can you say that everything is dependent on other and this is the real principle behind the whole cosmos? The real principle or the fundamental principles behind the existence of whole cosmos. So, based on these two grounds, Shankara criticized Buddhism. Now, Buddhist is the final answer, the claim that everything is changed, it is a logical conclusion, but not a noticed fact. If you see that, Buddhism claim that the theory of momentariness is a logical conclusion, it is a derivation from something, but it is not a noticed fact. You cannot identify some fact like a table and chair. So, therefore, he again criticizes Sankara and therefore, establishes his own standpoint known as theory of momentariness or Khyanikavada. Thank you.